Hey everyone, Prof Dot here. Um, Ryan here. <laughs> it's gonna be weird merging the two identities here. Um, hi, it's me. I'm here with another Pokemon thing. And it's going to be a bit of an unscripted, off the cuff spoiler review of Pokemon Scarlet. Um, you can include Violet in this, but I play Pokemon Scarlet and um, I've played it, I think it's like 36 hours that it took me to get to the credits. I haven't done post game and I haven't done um, some things that I'll get into, but I've seen a solid chunk of what the game has to offer. And for a quick non spoiler uh, of my feelings on it, is I loved it. I've also loved every other Pokemon game, so your mileage may vary. Um, if you enjoyed Legends Arceus and then hoped that it, would, it was going to be even better, like if they followed on the same things that Legends Arceus did, then you're going to enjoy Scarlet and Violet. Um, I really enjoyed it. I'm going to talk about some of the things I really enjoyed, some of the things that I wish could be done better. And that ending, oh my god. <laughs> okay, so um, first and foremost, I want to give you a rundown of my team that I used. There are going to be spoilers in this video for things that haven't been officially revealed. Um, so here's your warning. If you don't want to know anything that hasn't been revealed, back out. Come back maybe after the game comes out, maybe after you beat it, whatever. So I started with Quaxley um, because I wanted to play my main file. Because I, I, I do want to say, before I start that, um, I did play this on an emulator. Um, the game did leak a few days ago um if you have any if that colors my opinion on the game i have this game preloaded it's already downloaded i've already bought it so if if you feel like me emulating the game harms how credible my opinion is in any way um i have bought the game and leading into that I'm planning on using Fue Coco on my main file, and I didn't want to use Fue Coco twice, so I decided my first playthrough would be with Quaxley, um, just so I could try it out, see its moveset, see its evolutions and whatnot. And overall, I'll say it was pretty good. Um, I wasn't super, super blown away. It wasn't my MVP on the team, but I enjoyed it. I liked the design. I liked the design a lot, I should preface. Um, it is basically kind of like a flamenco dancer. And it's, well, first of all, its run cycle is really good. I love it. It is Yasified, as the internet may call it. Um, water fighting type, it learns a lot of good moves. And its, it's uh, exclusive move, Aqua Step, raises its speed. It's like 70 base power. It's, it's good. It's good. I feel like it was good. Um, I really didn't have a lot of complaints with it. I, I just generally don't like physical water types as much as special water types. Um, with the exception of Quagsire, which we'll get to Quagsire in a moment. Um, but yeah, I, I had no general complaints. It, it, it fit the mold of what I wanted it to be and it did its job. Um, yeah, uh, it does get a new move, which is really good though, before I end off of uh, Craxley's final evolution, which is named Quaquabble. Um, it gets this move, it's a new ice type physical move called Ice Spinner. It's like 80 BP, and it clears the field of hazards, which is like super good, so it's just rapid spin, but better, and ice type, and physical. So um, I did see Sneasels in the game, so Weavile is going to be loving that. Anyway, moving on, um, I caught the Paldean Whooper, and he is a little boy. He is a good boy, and he ended up becoming one of my MVPs on the team. Um, Paldean Whooper does not evolve into Quagsire or a Paldean Quagsire. Instead, it is a new Pokemon called Clodsire, and this Pokemon is a big boy. He's, he's kind of like what if you mix a Wailord with a Quagsire. And I love him. He's ground poison. So he is weak to ground. He is weak to water. But man, just the things that he gets. He gets earthquake through level up. Um, he gets poison jab through level up. 
He gets Toxic Spikes through level up. And he's one of the few Pokemon that can still learn Toxic because uh, TMs are A, back, B, they're consumable again, but C, you can make them using materials that you get from defeating Pokemon. Um, but they've also done a lot of balance changes where a lot of really good moves that a lot of Pokemon used to be able to get, they're no longer able to get them. So Toxic is one of the big ones. Basically, if you're not a Poison type, you're not going to be learning Toxic. I don't know the full like move list. There might be some Pokemon that are the exception to that rule, but generally, um, Toxic is now for like Poison types and Pokemon that you think would learn it based on their looks. Um, and the same actually goes for Scald, which is a very, very prevalent move in uh, Generation 5, 6, 7, and 8 metagame. Uh, Scald is a base, I think it's like 65 water move that has a chance of burn, which is crazy good. They made that move exclusive to Volcanion now, um, who is in the game's data, but is not going to be available until Pokemon Home update comes uh, in spring. So that kind of offsets a lot of utility that a lot of defensive water type Pokemon like Gastrodon, like Quagsire, like... Um, I don't know. Any any water Pokemon was better by having Skull on it, unless they were strictly physical, like Quack Quabble. Um, and even Quack Quabble could could see use in having Skull on it for the burn chance. But they have made a weaker variant of Skull that is 50 base power that guarantees that it lowers the opponent's attack, called Chilling Waters. Now. I like this a lot because you guarantee, you're not playing with RNG with, with a Scald, but you guarantee that chance by trading off some of your power. So I think um, that Pokemon like Gastrodon, because Gastrodon does get this move, is going to benefit from Chilling Waters a lot. Um, anyway, Cloud Sire. Uh, it also gets Toxic Spikes, Spikes, and... Or no, not Spikes. It gets Toxic Spikes, Stealth Rock, and... Uh, Oh, there was one more. It might get spikes. Um, I didn't. There might be a spikes TM somewhere that I didn't see. But it, it it's very good. And toxic spikes was super helpful um, for some parts that I'll talk about later. But Qua -Qua, or Claude Sire, really good. One of my two MVPs for the team. Now third, I got Fido, um, who was the little fairy dog who looks like a a bread loaf, and I love the name. And I hoped that the evolution's name would have been Purebred, because that's perfect. But instead, Fido evolves into a Dachshund, um, which is my fiancé's favorite dog type, so it's like perfect. Um, and his name is Dox Bun, and it has little space buns, literal space buns, um, for, on its ears. And it... It's, it's the strangest thing. I, I looked at its stat spread after I beat the game, and it is physically defensive out the ass. It's not as physically defensive as, say, Leafeon with, like, 130 base defense, but it's got, like, 115 base physical defense, which really kind of shocked me. Um, it's a very fast, very defensive mod that has a good chunk of physical attack. Um... It's also got this ability that makes it so when it's hit by fire type moves, its defense grows um, because it's bread. <laughs> it's like well-baked body. I love it. Um, yeah, it's pretty good. It, it gets play rough relatively early, and its its move pool is probably one of its weakest parts. It, like mine still had a lick on its final move set, but it had fire fang, uh, crunch, play rough, and then lick. Um, I'm sure there would have been something else I could have found on it, but it really only needed to play rough when it came out. Um, yeah, really good. Cute. I liked it a lot. Then I got um, Armor Rouge. Uh, I got its pre-evolution uh, Char Cadet, which I'm just getting the cadet pun now that I'm saying it out loud. But uh, this was my other MVP Pokemon. I love Armor Rouge's design. I love, love, love Serial Edge's design more. And I'm so upset that I picked Scarlet for that reason alone. 
but there are other reasons why I like Scarlet, you know, after the fact. Um, this Pokemon was really good. It's Fire Psychic, and it just, it just hits really hard. It's decently fast, and one thing of note, um, their entries on the Pokemon website list, like, their, their exclusive moves. Don't expect you're going to be getting those moves during the playthrough until the very end. I didn't realize that. Um, Armor Rouge gets a uh, fire type special close combat, and Serral Edge gets basically a fire, I believe it's fire type drain punch, or it's ghost type drain punch. Uh, it learned it at like level 64, so way, 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 way late into the game. But at the same time, um, it's not lacking for moves. It learns Psy Shock through level up. It learns Flamethrower through level up. It learns Lava Plume. Um, its early moveset is kind of hard to work with. You have, like, Flame Charge. And that's really about it. Um, evolving it was something I had to look up because I never would have found it otherwise. There is a town that is, if you're looking at the map, it is just northeast of the Great Crater. It's called Zapapico. Um, there's an NPC there in Zapapico. He will, once you talk to him, he says that he loves Charcadet and he's willing to trade you the item to evolve Charcadet if you give him 10 Pokemon material. Now, if you're playing Scarlet version, it is the material that Bronzor drops. And if you're playing Violet, it's the material that Sinistee drops. Or Poltegeist, whichever one's the first evolution. Um, because Scarlet has Bronzor and Violet has uh, Poltegeist and Sinistee. So, if you're using Charcadet slash and you want to use one of those two, find where Bronzor and Sinistee are because you will want to get at least 10 of those materials if you want. Um, you want that. It's very interesting I say that, that they're exclusive, but I'm pretty sure I've seen Wild Poltegeist in, in the lake area in Scarlet. So they could have a different spawn in Violet in, for Bronzor. Um, Bronzor spawn near the ruins near Ar Aratosa, Artosia. The, the grass town, the town with the grass gym, there should be like just south of it, there's like this canyon kind of maze area. Um, there are some ruins there that Bronzor spawn in. Um, after that, I picked up a Scyther. I know that uh, trading was going to be unavailable to me unless I did some wacky shenanigans with uh, emulator stuff. And I knew that Cleaver was going to be unavailable to me until Home comes out in early spring. So I just wanted to use a Scyther um, just, just to have it. And um, oh, I also, uh, Terrell's Sizzlation is a cool thing. Um, I'm bringing this up because my Charcadet that I caught was actually from a Terra Raid battle. So it had the Water Terra type. So I could protect against its weaknesses if I face against any like Water or Ground types because I could just make water type instead of being fire psychic um so that's cool that really helped me out and my scyther um was a scyther that i found in the wild that had a terror type because you can find them in, just in the wild they'll be glowing um but you don't know what type it is until you enter the battle and i caught this scyther and it had a normal terror type which i was like oh man that's kind of shitty but but um my scyther had technician so that is if a move has 60 or less BP or power, I say power or BP, it's the same thing, um, then it increases the power of that move by, I believe, like 1.5 times. So a 60 base power move would basically be 90 base power. Um, and Scyther has a lot of low BP moves in its moveset to take advantage of that. So I had um, double hit, which is really good with uh, technician, but I also had quick attack, which is priority, and having a Nora normal type Terra type means I can also benefit from stab from double hit and quick attack. I really didn't do it, the Terra type with double hit all that often, but a stab quick attack technician 
was it more than enough to help me in more than a few times and if i were to give an honorary third mvp spot it would be to scyther because of that um especially near the end <laughs> oh boy um so that was really cool and the final move i had on it was i asked, i had like wing attack um but i also had this new bug type move called pounce which is 50 base power bug physical and then it guarantees that it lowers the opponent's speed which is really good um so bug types are are getting a lot of good this generation maybe not so much with the pokemon themselves but that's another story um and then my final team member oh who was it oh um i picked up so this is a pokemon that wasn't revealed beforehand um it is actually it, it was it was unofficially revealed in one of the trailers um this is one of the pokemon that was on the uh mini map that wasn't officially like named or whatnot it's the little rock salt mario mushroom um which is named nackley n-a-c-l-i which I love the name because it's based off of the elements of the periodic table, uh, sodium chloride iodine. Um, I love the name. And its evolutions names are also really fun to say. Um, there's, they look like Minecraft enemies. <laughs> I love it. Um, the second one is named Knackle Stack. And the third one is Gargle Knackle. Gargle Knackle. Um, I named mine uh, Big Thankies. Or no, McThankie. Big McFanky from McFankies because of the Jimmy Neutron scene. Anyway, um, this is a pure rock type. It's very physically bulky. It's very specially bulky, which surprised me. Um, it's got solid attack. It's slow as sin. And it was pretty good. Um, rock type is probably one of the worst types kind of overall, which sucks. But it was pretty good. Um, it learns Earthquake naturally. It learns rock slide and stone edge naturally it has its its exclusive move is um salt cure which is a 50 base power rock type move which sort of acts like whirlpool in a sense like fire spin it doesn't well i don't know if it traps them but it, it does residual damage um so pairing that with claude sire's toxic spikes was really helpful for some battles um and one of its ability it has sturdy because it's a rock type that's the one, like, I caught one with Sturdy. But I did find out that its other ability, um, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, it's something to do with Salt. It makes it so it's unaffected by opponent's status effects. So it can't be poisoned, it can't be paralyzed, can't be put to sleep, all that. Um, that's going to come back <laughs> later on. And so overall, my team was pretty, pretty solid. I liked it. Um, I didn't fully white out, well... There, there was one battle I waited out against, and I'll talk about that when we get to the end of the Titan battle, or the Titan path. So, that was my team. I went through the game. I tried to prioritize the Titan hunting first. Um, my order I went was Titan hunting, uh, Team Star, and then the gym battles. Although I did do a gym battle first. I did the bug type gym, which I believe is the canonical first gym that you're supposed to go to because it was like level 14, 15-ish. And after I did that first gym, I just didn't do gyms until I did everything else. And that's because I know, or I knew from some of the leaks that the Titan uh, storyline is how you strengthen Koriden or uh, Miraiden up so that you can uh, use more of the ride capabilities like uh, gliding or jumping higher or dashing. So I'll get out of the way. The upgrades that you get um, from the Titan upgrade, you get it after every Titan you beat, you get the ability to dash, which is really helpful. Um, you do that by clicking in the left stick. Uh, glide. Um, so if you jump and then you press B, while you're jumping in the air, you can glide a short distance. I do notice that if you're gliding for a longer period of time, your rate of fall off is a lot greater. It's not like an exact, you can't straight angle it because the farther you travel, the more uh, Karidin gets tired out. So you will like fall faster. Um, you can still go a great distance, don't get me wrong, but it's 
it's noticeably different than say uh braviary or the uh parasail from breath of the wild uh you can scale vertical surfaces um which was the last one i got and then there's jumping higher so each of these is really helpful in navigating the world and if you want the most seamless experience i would recommend going for the titan uh, storyline although i do think that the intended method uh that the game wants you to do is to do all three storylines at once to like go from one to another to another to another to another and i think i might do that on my main file um because the levels don't scale which does stink but also it's kind of fun going to a gym that you're not supposed to be at way out of order and see if you can beat it um because that's the thing too there are no gates there's no story gates with one big exception and that's the great creator in the center solely because that is you can't access that until you complete all three stories for a good reason um but you can go to any gym provided you can like physically get there so like if you have one or two of the titan um challenges cleared you can go anywhere and it is really freeing and it reminds me a lot of generation one where when you leave the rock tunnel you can go to either celadon or you can go to saffron or you can go to fuchsia it's that choice right there magnified by like 13 different options 18 different options however many there are total uh 10 yeah 18 different options and it is really cool and that's what i did with my second gym badge like because i had finished all five titan quests which the last titan quest i was definitely like i shouldn't have been there um my team was about level 40 ish because i was I, I will say i'm a person who grinds in rpgs so i was like sending my pokemon pretty obsessively um out into the auto battle function which i'll talk about in a minute which is really good for helping you train pokemon up and especially for like training one specific pokemon up over others so i was level 40 ish by the time i finished the titan quest right before the final battle of it um don't take that as a baseline experience. I grind because I like seeing numbers go up. That's just who I am. So like that is like it taking it to its 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 extreme. So when I was at that point, I was at the final battle of um, the Titan uh, quest line, which is against Arvin, the your rival for the quest, um, because he's testing your ability to see if you have the spunk so it be to enter the uh, the great crater and his team was like high 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 50s and his ace I think was like 64 65 and I was like 20 levels below him and that was tough I died um, but I started a plan for a strategy which involves Claude Sire and having toxic spikes and since Claude Sire has some bolt behind it I was going to try to do a little bit of some shenanigans. Um, unfortunately, Arvin has a Garganacle, which is immune to all status conditions. So I could not beat him there and then. I had to stop and I had to go do other things because I needed to level up my team. Because the struggle is that Arvin starts out with a Greedon, which sounds like a garbage Pokemon, but this Greedon has Earthquake, this Greedon has Psychic Fangs, and it has Body Slam. And this motherfucker was so lucky with its paralysis with Body Slam. But it having, having Claude Sarah off front, I needed him to at least live one um, Earthquake and to get the Toxic Spikes off, but then I shifted into using Yawn and then toxic spiking spiking i i eventually beat it later but i had to go train up a little bit do some other things so i fought the psychic tip type gym after that and that is one of the last gyms i think it's the fifth it's either the fifth or the sixth gym it's 
trainers were like mid 40s so like by the time I got there I was like right at level with it um, and then I did some of the team starfall bases around and by the time I finished team starfall I went and cleaned up Arvin and and then I cleaned up the gyms I basically went from gym to gym to gym to gym to gym, to gym since I had most of the area like the map explored um, doing all the other stuff and I will say the story I liked it. The story of each path is unique because with the gym challenge, you have the arrival in Nimona, who is the girl with the, like the green hair, uh, hair, hair, the, the uh, not a hoagie. Um, and I like her as a rival. She is friendly, but she is also extremely competitive, and she is always looking for a battle and she is always looking to like test you because she is noted to have been the champion before like she the champion is a sort of title that anybody can earn but not one specific person will take over the role of champion like uh gita the woman with the uh black hair with the highlights who looks like a world end club character um <laughs> Is she's she's the champion. So anytime anybody beats like goes for the championship, she, they fight her. It's not like a case of where Blue beat Lance, so he becomes the champion, and then you become the champion. So now you're supposed to be it. It's he is the champion, and then whoever beats her gets that role of being a champion. Um, so even before you start the game, Nimona has gotten that title. She has like a fully prepared team, but she like starts over with you. She picks a starter that um, that you are strong against to kind of like help teach you about type advantages because she doesn't need to like prove herself necessarily right then and there because she she did her journey she completed her championship she she did all the gyms and I think that's a really cool dynamic because it's sort of like a blue like one step ahead of you but on a much larger scale but she's not a clone of blue because she's she's very friendly but not like x and y rivals friendly like she doesn't worship the ground you walk on but she's very she's she's just very excited to have you as a friend and to be able to like have someone to to, to battle against and to challenge her and the culmination of that art is really good because you have a final battle with her um, on the school grounds after the champion and it was a hard battle um, even though I was like higher level um, she had a really good team and her ace outside of her starter I would say her most iconic Pokemon is definitely her Lycanroc um, day form and that's really cool because not a lot of Pokemon or not a lot of people give love to Lycanroc or not enough people um, so I was really satisfied by that storyline it was a very that's like your most default Pokemon versus your rival story. Um, and I enjoyed it. And the gym leaders were all well designed. I liked them a lot. I I really like Larry, the normal type gym leader, who is literally there to fight you on his lunch break because he's just like businessman. I love it. Um, the gym tests were pretty okay. They're fine. Um, the only one that I was kind of like uh, at was the normal type one because you have to find it's um, the main thing in the town is like this huge restaurant that has like this legendary secret menu item. So you have to battle trainers around town who are also trying to. I like the, I mean, yeah, by the way, I like the concept of it, but the execution kind of boils down to you have to answer several prompts to be exactly what they want and you find the clues by battling the other trainers. Um, I like it, it was a cute way to do that style of gym test. I still don't overly like that style of gym test, but if there was one that I had to choose, that one's probably the best one of them. Um, Iono's one was really cute. Um, you're basically playing a game of Where's Waldo with uh, Director Clive, um, the headmaster of the Naranja school. Um, it's really funny because because Iono doesn't want to collab with you until you boost her stream enough. Uh, she's such a toxic Poketuber, it's great. Um, and 
Uh, Brassies is one. Is like find the some floors. That's fine. Um, the psychic type gym ones was kind of eh. It's like a. It's not a rhythm game. It's like a Simon. It's a game of Simon Says. Um, it's kind of whatever. It was harder only for the fact because I had my buttons swapped because I was playing on an Xbox controller. So I had A and B swapped to what a normal Switch controller would be. So they had the button prompts up on the screen and I had to like force myself to do the opposite of what I would normally would have do. Um, so that was tough, but for not any reason that they designed for. Um, the ghost type gym which is up in the far north in the snowy area. There's a, there's a snow there's an ice type gym in the snowy area too. This one's further north. Um, it had double battles, which were notably the only double battles in the game. Even that it was two gym trainers and then the gym leader. Those are the only double battles in the main story, which was interesting. Um, and also another thing with battles is. Nobody used any items, and nobody swapped out any Pokemon. Not even, like, the Elite Four or the Champion. Nobody used any full restores. So that was interesting. I'm not going to say that it is bad, because at the end of the day, in my experience, there wasn't a situation where somebody healing would have changed the outcome. It only would have wasted time, so I guess I'm thankful for it. But it was a very noticeable thing where I almost planned to do a move in anticipation of them healing, but then they didn't, so then I just stopped planning for it, hoping that it didn't bite me in the butt, and then it never did. Um, but anyway, yeah, the gym leaders were cool. The um, Elite Four was interesting. They do reuse a gym leader kind of in like a Koga style, where he's the gym, where he's the Elite Four member, but in the same game. But I think it's because the theme of the Elite Four is there's like a member of each age demographic. There is a small child. <laughs> Her name is Poppy. Um, she is the Steel type Elite Four member. There is kind of like a young adult woman named Rika, who I love her design. Um, it's androgynous as fuck, and I love it. Um, she is the ground type. Although she definitely strikes me as a flying type user, but she's not the flying type user because Larry, the businessman who had to fight us on his lunch break, um, doesn't use normal types like he does for his gym. He, he, he makes comments like, the champion said I can't use the type I normally use, so I here I guess I'll just use flying types. Um, so he uses flying and then uh, Hassel, I think is the last guy. He's like the older man. Um, he uses dragon types. They were cool. I liked them. Their teams were definitely tough. Um, and that's about... And the champion champion team was all right. Um, Avalug definitely has me confused. But... Um, she did have this one Pokemon called uh, Glamora. I think it is. It's like a flower, like a crystallized flower. Um, it's poison rock, kind of like Nihilego, but its ability is nuts. It's like toxic debris. Anytime it's hit physically, it spews toxic spikes on the other side of the field. Really nuts. Would have been a huge problem for me if I didn't have Cloud Sire to negate that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it for the Champion's Path. I, I liked it. It was the one I did last. I think of them, it's the one I liked the least because it was the most one. Like I expected everything that was going to happen. I just enjoyed what I expected. The Team Star um, was the one I thought I was going to like the least, but I liked it more than I more than I thought I was going to. The setup for the gameplay is the same. You partner with this student who is named Clive, and. It's so funny. It's it's Dr. Clavel, the headmaster, in a, a young boy's school uniform, and his hair is like done up kind of like uh, a mixture of Larry Butts from Phoenix Wright and Darian Crescent, also from Phoenix Wright. Um, and the whole the whole time, he's like, my name is Clive. I don't know a director Clive or 
a director Clavel. I don't know who you're speaking about. And the main character is like not buying it for the slightest bit of moments. Each time you encounter him, he's like, oh, director Clavel? And he's like, my name's Clive. Shush! You're gonna ruin it. Um, it's so funny because he is involved in the sense that Team Star are students that were previously um, at the school, but due to an incident, they banded together because they were all bullied. And bullying was like a huge problem at the school. And they like stood up for themselves, but they kind of took it too far. So they kind of exiled themselves from the school because uh, their big boss took the rap for um, their like crimes, quote unquote. And this is all before Director Clavel. Like this incident made the previous headmaster resign due to like the severity of it. And so Director Clavel came into the situation, sees all these past students like this and like the teams they formed because Team Star's like members are like trying to recruit people to their, their cause. Um, so he's trying to like find a resolution for it. And so he does so, but he doesn't want to like he people know that he's the director, so he disguises himself. And it's a really good story because you each time you beat a star leader, um, you get a backstory scene of all of them together, and like you get more of their history revealed. Um, and it's really more heartwarming than I thought it was going to be because each of them has a really good relationship w with each other and they each have like a purpose that they fulfill for Team Star and for like the formation of the team them and the big boss and I ended up liking those characters a whole lot um, and also the character designs I will say on, on a whole are like really good and varied there's a lot more androgynous characters than I would have normally expected in a Pokemon game, and a lot of po Pokemon characters that you may not immediately, like... You may not immediately see the gender that they are just based on looks alone, and I think that's really... It is really, like, progressive. Especially for Pokemon as a series, which usually has tried to do things, like, under the radar, like with the, um, the trans beauty and X and Y and whatnot. Um... It's really cool, and Team Star definitely embraces that. Like, Mela is very, very outwardly feminine. Um, traditionally feminine, I should say. But then you have uh, Atticus, who is like a ninja, but he also has like a... He's all dolled up, but he is also very, like, effeminate. And then you have Aerie, who is... I, I'm assuming female, but she is also very, like... She's very muscular. She's very strong. She's very determined. She's very she's a very good character. I like her a lot. Um, it's just a lot of norms that you might think would not be so are being like challenged and broken here, and that is also true with like Grusha. Everybody thought that Grusha was a chick. Um, I I feel bad for saying chick was was female. <laughs> My apologies. Um, but having Grusha be male is that kind of like idea where you don't necessarily... Your first assumption may not be entirely correct to who they are, but that's kind of kind of the point. Like, until you get to know somebody, you don't really know them. Um, and they also did a rich, kind of like pampered character that wasn't super annoying. Like, he was... He had like a few moments where he's like, mm, but... He ended up being, like, a really good part of the team. And I really like Team Star. Which culminates into... Um, oh, before it culminates. Uh, their boss battles were pretty interesting. Um, you have 30 Pokemon that you have to defeat in auto battle, which I didn't talk about auto battle. Oops. You know, it's off the cuff. Um, auto battling is you basically can send a Pokemon out, kind of like you did in Legends Arceus for the materials, except you can send them out and they can fight other Pokemon. And the general idea is uh, Pokemon that are 
it's it's largely a type kind of game. I don't know how much secondary type plays into it because I've had some experiences where some Pokemon that were weak to my Pokemon second type came out victorious. So I still have to do some like testing with it. But generally, um, use type advantage solely as your indicator for if auto battling is going to go out well for you. Um, and they have you pick three Pokemon to cycle in auto battles to beat three, 30 Pokemon. It's usually not that hard. If you spread your team types around, you should have enough Pokemon to fight. Um, the types for them are uh, Poison, Fire, Steel... No, not Steel. Poison, Fire, Fairy, Fighting... Oh, what was the last one? Uh, I can't remember it. <laughs> Oops. Um, I'll remember it soon, and then I'll just add it wherever. But So you gotta prepare for that against that specific type. And then, then you fight the leader who has a team of their own of that type. Um, which are all like decently strong. And then you fight the car that they're on, because the car is a modified um, modification of the Pokemon Rev of Room, I think it's called. Normal Rev of Rooms are in the wild, and they are Poison Steel type. Um, but the ones on these cars are specifically outfitted to be the type of the leader. So, like, the Fermellos, it is Fire type. And for Ares, it's a Ari as in like E-R-I, not A-R-E-S, not the God of War. Although she would fit. Um, hers was fighting type. And they have this move called Combat Torque, or it's like a blank torque that fits whatever type they are. Um, I don't believe that the car version of River Room is obtainable. I don't know the specifics though because I haven't caught one. I have seen them around, it just didn't specifically interest me. Um, I do think the move will be available for... You might be able to like learn those moves for it, but I don't think you'll be able to get those types for it, unless you terastalize. Um, and then it culminates... Um, the person that you're in contact with throughout the Team Star is... They, they call you on your phone, and they use like, a code name, Cassiopeia. Um, and after each uh, round of the Star... Uh, areas, you get called by Cassiope, you update them on the status, and then they send over their supply person to give you, like, your rewards, which happens to be Penny, the girl with the Fire Emblem red-blue hair. And she's very, like, noticeably quiet. She doesn't like speaking all that much. She's kind of like, um... Oh, what's his face? The little kid from the Destiny Deoxys movie, who is voiced by Mokuba's voice actor. Um... Ah, oh, it's gonna bother me too. I'll put up a picture of him. And... Because uh, each time Koraiden comes out and like, says hi, and she's like, ah, Pokemon. She's not afraid of Pokemon, but she's just like afraid of... She's she's very soft-spoken. She's someone who um, w you would think would be bullied, which is a very easy-to-guess plot twist that she is Cassiopeia. But what's interesting is um, after you beat all five Team Star bases, Director Clive has you come to the Academy after kind of learning all of their their stories. He reveals that he's Cassiopeia and you battle him. Um, and once you beat him, which is interesting to note because he has the third starter because he's the one who brings them to you at first. And after Nimona picks one and you pick one, he takes the last one. Kind of like how Leon did in Sword and Shield. Um, so he has the last order. For me, he had uh, Meowskarda, the final form of Sprigatito, um, which was pretty tough because that thing is fast. Um, once you beat him, he says that he's not really Cassiopeia, but he knows who is, and they're waiting in the school. And... He wanted to test to make sure that you were able to bring it into this peacefully, because if you weren't able to, then he was going to have to. And 
he wanted us to be able to do since we had this connection with, with them, with Penny. So you go into the school stadium where you meet Penny, and she has a final confrontation with you because she said that she is the leader of Team Star. She's the one who kind of first formed it because, shocker, she was like one of the main targets of being bullied. And she's the one who took the rap for all the others when the thing, when their kind of stand up effort went wrong. Um, and her like punishment was going to be like relocated to Galar for 18 months, which is very interesting because now I want to replay Sword and Shield and see if there's any hint of Penny whatsoever. Um, because obviously she doesn't physically show up, but there might be some NPC that says something somewhere. But so she has like come back after that point and she wants to help disband Team Star and to get everybody to like reacclimate to the school. But she says that she wants to test our determination to do so and to see if it's really the right thing to do. So she has like Director Clavel record the fight so it goes out to everyone everywhere so that the true finale of the battle gets decided here. And something that I didn't catch or I should have caught based on the design element, she has an Eevee backpack. Um, totally slipped my mind. She has a full evolution team. I think the only one she doesn't have is Espeon because she chooses Sylveon instead as her ace. Um, so that was cool. And I like it when teams are themed like that. Um, it definitely did take me off guard and she was really strong because I did this before I did the gym challenge so I was like this is when I got to like the 50s and she was again in the 60s and then finally um, the story for the Titan hunting campaign is I think my favorite because it centers around Arvin um, who you learn early on had Koridan's Pokeball when you first like encounter it in the story and you go think huh why did he have that um it turns out very early on you learn that he is professor sada's son or professor turo's son depending on which version you're playing and professor sada and turo are um working in the great creator they've been working there the entire game and as such arvin had to kind of just like be by himself for a lot of time and he had his his ace pokemon his mabostiff which is another dog pokemon um it complete completes the dog trio of uh fido grievand and uh mastiff which is so this dog is dark and ground and then mabostiff is its evolved form i don't like mastiff's design but i but Arvin's relationship with Mabostiff really turned me around to it. Um, because he's searching for the Herba Mystica, like the mystical herbs that are dotted throughout the, the region that are being protected by these Titan Pokemon because they are what make the Titan Pokemon grow into Titan Pokemon. Um, and he's searching for them. The, the trailers made it seem like he's just searching for them to make really good food, which is like true, but he's trying to make the good food because... His Mabostiff is, like, critically injured. Like, death's door, critically injured. To the point where we ask him, like, why don't you use a potion? And he's like, potions aren't going to work for this kind of injury. Or this kind of sickness, like, whatever it is. And you're like, oh, shit. So each one, each um, sandwich that you make with the herb, um, funnily enough, like, you give yours to Koridan or Maridan. And it powers it up to get, to restore one of its old abilities, um, but Arvin gives his to Mabostiff, and with each one you do, you see it get a little bit stronger. Like with one, it opens its eyes back up finally, which is like terrifying to think that this poor dude and his dog, who is on death door, like can, it can finally see. Like it's still in pain. Like just you feel for Arvin. If you have a dog, you've had if you've had a pet. Um, I think this path will really resonate with you. Um, just the, the small victories that he gets really changes your view on Arvin because at the beginning he's very he's very uh, rough around the edges. Um, he's he's not your typical 
friendly rival, but he's not your typical douchey rival. Like, he has a very specific reason why he is, like, kind of sheltered and kind of awkward and, like, rough around the edges because he has this, like, complex with his mom, for me, because she basically abandoned him to do her work in the Great Crater. And she, like, she reaches out after each, um... After each Titan, she calls you on the phone and you speak over like video chat. And she's like, Oh, I see that Koridon has restored one of its abilities. I'm glad I trusted you with uh, keeping it keeping it safe and whatnot. Very noticeably, does not like call Arvin at all. Um, so, like, I get it. And it reminded me a lot of the Lily and uh, Lusamine really dynamic, kind of. And I'm going to bring that up again later because this dynamic is probably my favorite in the whole game. Um, and Arvin is very like antagonistic toward Karaidan. Not antagonistic, but like he he really doesn't just like care for Karaidan. Like whenever Karaidan, um, you give Karaidan your sandwich, he's like, "Oh my god, I can't believe you did that!" And I made this for my friend, and you, you wild animal, you ate the sandwich, and you're like, "Whoa, it's fine. I gave it to him. He's cool." Um, but as you do more and as you help more. He stops being so outwardly kind of brash against Koraiden. He doesn't noticeably like forgive Koraiden, but I think the implication is there, which I think is good because I think it would have been too much if you just had him all of a sudden become like best friends or suddenly be like, oh, I see the error of my ways. It's a very slow growth because for Arvin, Koraiden represents everything that's wrong with his relationship with his mother because Koraiden. Um, was originally owned by Professor Sada. It came from the Great Crater, and she left it with Arvin to protect. For Arvin to protect Koraiden, not the other way around, which is like very... It's a slight difference, but it's a very noticeable difference. And so so Koraiden symbolizes everything that Arvin wishes was better about his relationship with his mom. So I can understand why he feels the way he does. And he does lessen it over time as you spend time together. And I really like that. Um, and even when you um, finish the Titan storyline and uh, Sada calls you and says, I need you to meet me in the Great Creator. I'm at the very bottom in what's known as the Zero Lab. Um, Arvin says, I don't want to go down there, but I know that you're going to and I would feel bad if something happened to you because you learned that Arvin had been there before and the reason his Mibostiff had gotten hurt was because of a terrible monster that had um, had like been roaming around there in the crater. So like he really doesn't want to go back there but because he knows that you're going to because that's the kind of person you are and because he, at the end of the day, he does want to confront his mother about everything that's going on. He decides that he's going to do it, but he figures they should ask for help. Which then leads you into doing the other two storylines, because then you'll get help from Penny and Nimona as like a four-person group. Um, and before I talk about the Great Creator, which is like the last part of my review that I'll talk about... Um, I do want to mention the trailer, the last trailer that we saw, um, revealed the ancient and the future Don fan designs. Um, you see this Pokemon in your Titan hunt. It is the Titan of the ground, who's kind of like in the lower left corner of the map. Um, you fight this this Don fan, which the this is what's known as like a paradox Pokemon. There's more of them in the Great Crater, but you do face Don Fan early on. They each have weird names as if they're being like scientifically studied. So it's not called Ancient Don Fan or Future Don Fan. It's like for um, Don Fan in the past, it's uh, Great Tusks. So each each one has like its name is like this scientific name. It doesn't have like a, a unique, I would say, name. Um, and that kind of sucks, so I'm going to be nicknaming anyone that I catch, because their names are kind of, eh, 
Like, I, I would like it more if those were like the Pokedex classifications or nicknames for them, and they had like a real name. But anyway, um, Don Fan, you can get before beating all three stories because after you beat the Titan one, you I hear you can find one that spawns around that area. I didn't find it, I did look, but I must have been looking in a wrong spot or just must have been unlucky. But that's the only one that you can find beforehand. Um, all the other ones are going to be once you enter the Great Crater, after you beat the Champion, you beat uh, Penny, and you beat Arvin. And, oh my god, this story section of like entering the Great Cavern is phenomenal. Probably like my favorite story section in a Pokemon game. And I really, really liked the ending of Legends Arceus. But this was something else entirely. The music in this area is so unsettling, and you know that something is wrong. You know that something is seriously wrong. Sada keeps messaging you, and she says, I'm locked in this lab. You need to come unlock these four locks using like in the right research stations that are dotted across the crater because you're traveling down in the crater made in abyss style and it's a really beautiful scene and the music is so unnerving i love it the atmosphere is so unnerving and as you're walking you'll have these cut scenes that dynamically play out or it's not so much cutscenes, but like the characters will be talking and like talking to each other because before this point they haven't really intermingled. Like Arvin and Nimona know each other from school, so they have like a little bit of history. Arvin thinks Nimona's annoying. Nimona thinks that Arvin's a little annoying. But here you get to see all three of these people that you've like interacted with throughout the story interact and like start to grow bonds to each other through you. And first of all. Each of these characters is fantastic, and their arcs are really well done. And seeing them interact with one each other, with one another, is like it's so good. Um, so that alone would make this my favorite like part of the game. Seeing all these relationships bloom and blossom and come into themselves. But where do I even begin? Like there are so many cool things. The, my, my one minor complaint is while they're talking, you can't auto battle with Pokemon. Because I wanted to train up against like the Venomoths and the like, uh, it's all these Pokemon that are in this area that are like really strong. That would be a really good experience, but you have to wait until they're done talking to be able to auto battle. So I just kept walking. I just said, you know, what, I'll train another time. It's fine. I'm pretty sure you can get into a battle. Like, you can just walk into Pokemon and get into a battle. I didn't test it because I didn't want to interrupt the story because I was I was hooked. And two very specific games came to mind with this entire segment as you're descending and you're learning more story and you're getting all this lore. Because first of all, these research labs have research documents that Sada had written up. And oh my god, I love it when Pokemon does this and they drip feed lore through through places that you can interact with but you don't have to interact with it's so good you even get to learn a little bit about the third legendary uh mm, i love it like literally peak literally peak and then with everything on top you're you're dealing with um the fact that koraiden is very obviously like traumatized it does not want to be here in the crater it is not coming out of its Pokeball. You can't ride it. You're going down this by foot. And I love taking that away from the player. Because that was one thing I was worried about. Um, was how am I going to feel like this is a huge adventure if I can fly and climb and do whatever I want. And they nailed it. Um, and... This section of the game reminded me of... Xenoblade, but very specifically, when you're at the end of a Xenoblade game, and you're at where all of the plot starts hitting, and you have that, like, oh shit feeling as stuff starts to hit the fan. That's what it felt like, and it also felt like Undertale. Which is very funny, considering that Toby Fox composed music for this game. Not all of it, but very significant portions that 
happen in this area. The final boss theme is composed by Toby Fox. It's so good. We'll get to that in a second. But the, the point in Undertale, Undertale spoilers, by the way, um, <laughs> when you are taking your walk and you're getting lore dumped about Asriel and the music is like pumping in the background, if you were, if you felt that scene like resonated with you, and if you felt like changed by the end of that scene, this is going to give you very similar feelings. It is nuts how effective this was, and I am not going to shut up about it right now because I'm not going to tell anybody about this in non-spoiler context because I need them to see this unspoiled. Holy shit. Anyway, you continue down. You go through all of the labs, the research labs, um, and then on the very last research lab, you see it is fucked. Glass canisters are broken. Uh, metal pipes are busted everywhere. Something went wrong here. And throughout this, you realize something. You haven't like physically seen Sada at all during your game. When you first meet her, Dr. Clavel brings up like a video feed because she's in the uh, bottom of the great crater, so she can't meet you physically. And in the last research station, the electricity kind of like fizzes out and Sada says like, oh, I'm sorry about this. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry about this, children. Oh, oh, sorry, children. Oh, I'm sorry, children. And then everybody's like, what the fuck's going on? And then like it cuts out and then you do undo the lock and it comes back on and she's like, oh, I'm sorry for that like misunderstanding. And Arvin he like goes straight quiet. He knows something's up. And it's not kind of hard. It's not hard to guess what's up, but um, Arvin like brings out this the book that he has had, the Scarlet book for Violet. It'd be the Violet book, the one that he's been kind of referencing throughout the story. This is something that Sada specifically requested he bring to the crater. Um, and it it flashes back to the entry with um, Great Tusk the Donphan ancient form and it pulls up the entry and I read this and I was like oh wow that's kind of dark but didn't expect that they'd go deep into it but oh my god so it says um, like this Pokemon is like massive blah 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 um, one of our team was mortally wounded because of this Pokemon and when I read it the first time I'm like oh shit implicit like very explicit death in Pokemon that's cool and then I just kind of let that be. Come to find out, um, the the journal entries uh, in the last lab, like it flashes that phrase back up on the screen for you to see. And then the journal entries are from Sada still. And one of them talks about how um, it's he's not named, but she says that Arvin's father left uh left her and left her with Arvin. So he's out of the picture. Um which is a very real like social thing that Pokemon usually kind of leaves to implication, but she kind of straight up just says it, which I was like, "Whoa, okay." Um and then she's like complaining now that she doesn't have another hand around to do the all the work that she needs to do. So it's implied that that uh Arvin's father was also a scientist. Um, like Professor Sada. And then the last diary entry says, I wish I could make another me so I could balance this work. And then it clicks and you go, oh my God, she's a robot. And then you go, oh my God, the one that was mortally wounded. And then Sada appears on the phone and she's like, you need to come down here. I'll explain everything. So you go deeper, and you're going deeper, and you're going deeper, and you enter this cave with all these beautiful crystals, um, which are like the source of the uh, terrestrialization, which is also very heavily implied that the third legendary is also heavily related to the terrest terrestrialization effect. Um, it's not given a name, but it is given like 
its name is redacted. It's six letters that are redacted. So it has six letters in its name. And you get to the very bottom and down, like you can see, I should also mention, um, as you're going through the research station, you do fight some Paradox Pokemon. The first of which for Scarlet version is a Paradox Jigglypuff named Screentail. It is very psychic and I love it a lot. Um, hate the name though. <laughs> the thing about Paradox Pokemon is they are single stage Pokemon, all of them. So even though normal Jigglypuff evolves, uh, Ancient Jigglypuff does not evolve, but it does not have the stats of normal Jigglypuff. It does have stats of a single stage Pokemon and they are really good. Each of the um, ancient Pokemon have stats that are really good, especially the exclusive ones for each game. We'll get to that in a moment. Well, well, I mean, they're they're all all the past ones are in Scarlet, all the future ones are in Violet. But I, I meant the the totem ones, like the very strongest ones. Um, so you fight the first Screamtail, you can't catch it, but more are in the wild. Um, then you get down to the very bottom, and you can explore more of the bottom but I almost got lost doing it so I returned but I did notice another paradox Pokemon there but I'll explain it in a moment so um, Sada had also mentioned that ver that really crazy Pokemon like crazy strong Pokemon were locked in the lab as with her um, and also that there was a second Coridon that was brought into into this time and it, it is revealed that it is through a time machine, um, which is only made possible due to the crystals that are in that like great crater, because it crazily enhances technology. Like the the zero lab at the very bottom is like basically half crystal at this point. It's like m merged with it. Um. So what they do, what she does, and how these paradox Pokemon exist is she sends the pokeball back in time it catches a pokemon and then comes back because humans for based on how the time travel works is it does not allow humans to travel to the past it's a very, it requires a very small amount of matter to be able to be transported so pokeballs so they're basically catching pokemon in the past and then releasing them into the present and that's how that Don fan, the Titan Don fan, got out is because it managed to breach the surface of the crater. And so the big threat is now more of these Paradox Pokemon are being sent to the present. What happens if they breach the crater? Like the environment's going to be fucked because these things are stronger than anything. And you unlock the gate, and the second Coridon shows up, and. Um, Nimona's like, oh, good, like, your friend's here. We can have a reunion. And this Coridon is pissed. It's very territorial. And then you realize that your Coridon is, like, having PTSD because it lost the last fight that it had with this Coridon. And that's why it, like, left. That Coridon, like, heads into the lab. And your team thought that the second Coridon was the strong Pokemon that was locked in the lab. But it just went into the lab, so what gives? Then out spills, uh, let's see, there is Amoongus. Um, a paradox Amoongus named Brute Bonnet. I like to call it Oongaboongus. Um, it's so good. Uh, there was some more Paradox Donphan there. There is a Paradox Mistrevis, um, which was Fluttermane, I believe it is. Um, fairy Ghost. The Donphan is uh, ground fighting, and I forget what Amoongus was. Um, grass something. And then you beat those in waves, and then you finally enter the Zero Lab, and you find Sada there, uh, while Arvin handles some of the other Paradox Mons. Nimona and Penny handle some of the other Paradox Mons. And you go in there, and Sada activates, and she reveals that the real Professor Sada is dead. She has been dead, and she has been continuing her will, and she has been guiding you 
here because she wants you to put a stop to it because them breaking out and causing havoc is not what Professor Sada would have wanted. And then the Koridon is there, the second Koridon is there, and Sada is like, no, you come back. And she holds out a fucking Master Ball. And a very important point with Sada is... <laughs> it's a small point, but it's so cool. They weren't just chucking, like, Pokeballs and Premier Balls back into the past. She was literally manufacturing Master Balls because... I want to ma- I want to say a quote that my brother told me because I was talking to him as I was doing this. Um... After all, you can't have potential specimen breaking out of those nasty Pokeballs. I love it. All of her team is in Master Balls. It's so awesome. Um, if I've not spoiled it already, the final boss is going to be against AI Sada. But you may say, well, she sounds like she wants to help you. What's going on here? Well, she is an AI. Her programming can be overridden. And the Zero Labs innards are the time machine, like this final chamber. And Sada programmed a fail-safe system because as much as AI Sada wants to believe in the humanity of Professor Sada, it is complicated because she programmed these fail-safes in to preserve her work at all costs. And she very clearly, like, abandoned Arvin. She very clearly chose her work above all else. But also, at the end of the day, when the two Koridan were fighting, um, this is a part that confused me because the notebook seemed to imply that Great Tusk was involved in the mortal wounding of a team member. But AI Sada seems to say that it was the Koridan fighting that caused this. It might be like a bit of both, like this, like Don Fan and Koridan might have escaped at the same time. It isn't clear when, who escaped when. But I'm going. I had canon as it happened at the same time. Um, AI Sada says that uh, before our Koridan was about to be like mortally wounded, she took the hit for Koridan so it could escape. And man, it's it's a complicated relationship, and it just goes to show that it doesn't. Her one act of sacrifice doesn't negate all of the wrong that she did, but also all of the wrong that she did does not negate her one act of sacrifice. It's a very muddled, gray character, and I really enjoy it because it's clear when it comes down to specifically preserving life and saving someone, she would do it. But if it doesn't threaten their life, then it does not matter to her over her work. And that's a very fine line to travel. And I'm going to say this for just a moment, just so I can go back to the battle. But um, after everything, AI Sada says, like, when Arvin's... He, he, Arvin is, like, fucking a wreck right now because he's seeing his mom for the first time ever. It's her voice, it's her looks, but it's not her because she's already dead. And AI Sada says, like, I have your mom's memories from when I was created, like, backward. And I know that she loved you. And Arvin, in in a weaker story, Arvin would like say nothing and would cry or something like that and be like, wow, she does love me. But Arvin, he's like, you don't get to say that right now. You can't say that. And then I, AI Sada is like, yeah, I guess you're right. Which is a very smart decision because it does not speak on the fact that Arvin is going through a fucking shitstorm right now, and he has been his entire life. And I don't think he has the capability to like forgive his mom for everything she's done in this exact moment. There could be a time that after enough time and personal healing is done, he can understand and like forgive her for the parts that she wasn't able to solve herself. But it's not something that should be asked of him right now in the moment. And especially when the truth of the matter is like if the truth was that she did love him, she would have shown that more in her actions. Her actions showed that she loved her work the most. And then when it came down to it, she would do something to benefit. It, it's it's definitely a complex relationship, and I think I like it more than the Lily-Lusamine relationship, because Lily does forgive 
Lusamine very quickly. Which is, I think, my one weak point with that relationship outside of Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon context. Um, so I think it's it's probably my new like favorite villain of the series. But I hate it because now I can't I can't say it because the fact that she is the villain is like super mega spoilers. Um, so I guess yeah, so I'll just say Scarlet and Violet's villain's my favorite. But anyway, um, you begin the shutdown of the time machine, but then the fail saves come in and overwrite AI status programming and force her to defend the time machine. And the battle arena is so pretty. It's this crystallized arena. And she battles you atop this huge spire. All her team is in Master Balls. They're all Paradox Pokemon. Um, I know the big threat of her team is supposed to be the Paradox Salamence, which is Dragon Dark. It swaps typings with Hydreigon, which is in the future Paradox. Um, but Paradox Salamence, I love its design, but it was not the biggest threat for me. For me, the biggest threat was Sandy Shocks, which is Paradox Magneton. Its magnets are its legs. It's weird, but I love it. This thing is fast and it is strong. I had nothing that could outspeed it on my team. I was going to get swept by this Sandy Shocks. But let me tell you, my boy Scyther, with its normal Terra type technician quick attack, saved my butt. It was nuts how close it came. Because because I was normal Terra type, because your type changes as soon as you terra terrestrialize, it's it takes priority over moves. So um being bug flying normally, obviously. Um Sandy Shocks was going to go for an electric type move, and I thought I was done for. But because I changed to normal type, the electric move was not enough to Oko me, and a quick attack was enough to take it out. I had damaged it a little bit with Toxic Spikes, um, with Claude Sire. And I was able to get a Salt Cure on because uh, Garganeckle has Sturdy, but I was not going to be able to take it out unless those specific events happened and it was so crazy the battle music is so good toby fox holy shit um and then after that happens uh ai saw his body like starts to like degrade and break apart but she's still like still together and she regains some of like her previous personality and she's like i'm so glad you were able to do that finally um but then like a second fail safe comes up because Sada is fucking insane and even AI Sada is like was this her true belief all along? Did she really care about her work this much? Bringing more like Grey into her situation? Um, as the second Coriding comes in and her overwritten programming like returns and this second phase of the final boss comes and your Coriden oh um, <laughs> I'm sorry uh, the part of the failsafe is the field around the space deactivates all Pokeball usage except for those under Sada's like, resi like designation. If it's not owned by Sada, it can't come out of its Pokeball anymore. And your whole squad is like, oh shit, what do we do? There's literally Koraiden here who is pissed. Um, th they're Koraiden, because our Koraiden's in the Pokeball still. But then... In a moment of like genius, you remember that your Coridon's original Pokeball was also registered to Sada. You go Coridon v Coridon, and this battle—it's a scripted battle. Um, it's the one battle where you have forced affection, where Coridon will tough out any attack, so you don't feel sad. But I think it works here because Coridon is standing up to this like previous bully which plays into the themes of the game, by the way. Um, this Pokemon that it lost to before. And then when you all like align with it, you terrestrialize and it's a dragon uh, Terra type. And you use Terra Blast, which turns into this massive, massive beam to finish off the battle. It's so good. It's so good. And 
at the end, um, the time machine starts like going crazy, and AI Sada says that she knows the only way she can stop it that because she can't leave the lab because she she, can, she can't break that programming to physically leave the lab, and she reveals that she was jealous of the squad because they had the freedom to explore and choose what they wanted to do. And so in her last effort, she makes a choice to use the time machine to go to the past herself to see the world that she, Professor Sada, was so enamored with, realizing that once she goes, she's gone because humans can't be brought to the future through that specific machine. And I mean, even if she's not a human, she is too much like matter or mass. Um, but realizing that with her going, so would the power for the time machine itself. So it would be putting an end to the spilling out of Paradox Pokemon. So she goes to the past. Arvin is still like a wreck because even though his feelings toward his mom are complicated as shit, and this isn't his mom, it still looks like her. It still sounds like her. And he sees her go. That's tough. That is tough to get over. But at the end, um, you all take this like group photo together. And once you're out of the crater and all of that, um, it's really sweet. The credits play. Ed Sheeran and jump scare. <laughs> um, this game, it's super special. I liked it a lot. The storytelling and the thematics work well with the gameplay. The story is really well told. The cutscenes were really manageable. They were well paced. The cutscene direction was really good. Um, the music was really good. The gym leader battle music kind of stunk. It didn't stink. It was okay. It's not better than Sword and Shield. Sword and Shield is my new favorite gym leader theme. Um, but I will say it is dynamic like Sword and Shield. It does have like the crowd cheering segment. And I think the crowd cheering segment of this game's gym leader theme is better melodically than the crowd cheering segment of Sword and Shields, but overall Sword and Shields theme is better. Um, but the other music is really good. The uh, Team Star grunt battle is really good. The Team Star boss battle is really good. Um, Titan battle is really good. Final boss is amazing. The great creator theme, oh my lord, I want to see who composed that immediately. It was so good. And there is even still so much that I didn't do. I didn't touch sandwich making. Um, I'm going to do a lot of that on my main file. I didn't touch anything with the school um, because you can like get social ranks with your teachers and you can do like lessons and like learn more lore. I didn't do anything with post game and I didn't do anything with the four legendaries that are unlocked after you pull these needles across the world kind of like mother three style they're hidden and the school aspect helps you learn where they are um but i didn't do anything with those i like as soon as i got to credits i stopped um because it's three days away i'm ready to like play my main file um i didn't expect this to be about an hour and a half I thought I was just going to talk a little bit about a portion of it, but here we go. Um, that's my thoughts on Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. I like a lot of the new Pokemon. I like most of the new Pokemon. And I'm excited to play a lot more of it. Um, yeah, so if you like this video and are still listening, uh, why don't you give me a like? Uh, maybe drop a comment if you've played it also. Uh, drop your thoughts down below. Make sure to tag any of your spoilers. Um, because I know that this is a spoiler video, but there are there's a portion in the beginning that isn't spoiler, so people may watch just that and may look at the comments. So very please tag spoilers. I will be alert. Um, if there are any untagged spoilers, I'll just remove them. So if you if you post a comment and it gets removed, it's probably because you may have posted spoilers accidentally or intentionally, whatever. Um, if you like this content, I have other Pokemon stuff that is going to be coming on the way. I am planning for a retrospective of each generation soon ish i still want to finish i the somnium files and i am currently working on a very big very long uh, comprehensive retrospective on fire emblem fates it is going to cover literally everything about that game 
my feelings on it, my history with the series, the history of the game's development, why it is the way it is. It's not going to be soon. I'm replaying each game so I can take notes. But it's going to be thick. Um, So that's going to be coming eventually. With that, thank you guys and check you guys next time.